Hillary Clinton's uh, foreign policy uh, and Hillary Clinton's worldview. Uh, we have to take into account this pattern of tending to be fairly uh, willing to use American power uh, militarily. So we saw that she didn't protest when there was a right-wing coup in one of our so-called allies, uh, Honduras, I believe, during her State Department ship. And that uh, we have evidence from my previous playlist that the uh, spokesman for the Gaddafi government claims that they stopped the army on the way to Benghazi and they got him on the phone and told him all. They told him all. See, the Gaddafis were fairly urbane, uh, integrated people in the world jet set. So for them, it was it, it, it was surreal because they thought they were in our world playing our game, and suddenly they found out they weren't. But they were on the phone trying to get a hold of their buddies, uh, people, contacts that they'd made in the U.S. and England and France, uh, and thought that uh, uh, they had reached an understanding. So if that's the case, Hillary Clinton is entirely disingenuous in saying that uh, she launched the attacks to stop a genocide. The die was already cast. The die for regime change was already cast. The question is, what kind of worldview would justify that in the first place? In the second place, uh, bring up the fact that Libya has now had an election to justify a uh, horrific devastation of that country. Uh, for uh, one-third of the population may have fled, and 100,000 out of 5 million which would be like, uh, you know, in the greater Portland area, 100 or 200,000 people uh, dying uh, or, uh, 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 you know, being severely tortured. Uh, so uh, how she can justify that. And uh, the peace, the, sort of the Blair Doctrine, was developed by this guy, Robert Cooper, and it's called the New Liberal Imperialism. Um, and I am going to review it with because I think this Blair Doctrine is a secretly sort of manifesto of interventionism and the whole mindset of the IMF and the World Bank and the NGOs and the whole apparatus of uh, regime change, uh, which uh, is uh, Hillary Clinton's business as a humanitarian interventionist, remaking countries uh, uh, based on their being morally defective. And uh, this article I will find for you right now. Robert Cooper uh, was interviewed at Valdai, uh, which is an annual meeting of nations uh, discussing with Russia uh, economic and uh, diplomatic issues uh, with uh, the president, Putin, directly. Um, uh, so you can re look at that if you go to the Valdai Club uh, YouTube channels. But this is this uh, important document, I believe, that he wrote in 2002. Um, I believe, before the invasion of Iraq. Uh, and in this document, uh, he describes, in 1989, the political systems of three centuries came to an end in Europe, the balance of power and the imperial urge. That year marked not just the end of the Cold War, but also, and more significantly, the end of a state system in Europe which dated from the Thirty Years' War. September 11th showed us one of the implications of the change. To understand the present, we must first understand the past, for the past is still with us. International order used to be based either on hegemony or on balance. Hegemony came first in the ancient world, order meant empire. Those within the empire had order, culture, and civilization. Outside it lay barbarians, chaos, and disorder. The image of peace and order through a single hegemonic power center has remained strong ever since. Empires, however, are ill-designed for promoting change. Holding the empires together... And it is the essence of empires that they are diverse, usually requires an authoritarian political style. I think this is a big assumption on this guy's part. Innovation, especially in society and politics, would lead to instability. Historically, empires have generally been static. In Europe, a middle way was found between the stasis of chaos and the stasis of empire, namely the small state. The small state succeeded in establishing sovereignty, but only within a geographically limited jurisdiction. Thus, domestic order was purchased at the price of international anarchy. The competition between the small states of Europe was a source of progress, but the system was also constantly threatened by relapse into chaos on one side and by the hegemony of a single power on the other. 
The solution to this was the balance of power, a system of counterbalancing alliances, which became seen as a condition of liberty in Europe. Coalitions were successfully put together to thwart the hegemonic ambitions, firstly of Spain, then of France, and finally of Germany. But the balance of power system, too, had an inherent instability, the ever-present risk of war, and it was this that eventually caused it to collapse. German unification in 1871 created a state too powerful to be balanced by any European alliance. Technological changes raised the cost of war to an unbearable level. The development of mass society and democratic politics rendered impossible the amoral calculating mindset necessary to make the balance of power system function. Nevertheless, in the absence of any obvious alternative, it persisted. What emerged in 1945 was not so much a new system as a culmination of the old one. The old multilateral balance of power in Europe became a bilateral balance of terror worldwide. The balance of power never suited the more universalistic, moralistic spirit of the late 20th century. It was not built to last. The second half of the 20th century had seen not just the end of the balance of power, but also the waning of the imperial urge. In some degree, the two go together. A world that started the century divided among European empires, finishes it with all or almost all of them gone. The Ottoman, German, Austrian, French, British, and finally, Soviet empires are now no more than a memory. This leaves us with two new types of states. First, there are now states, often former colonies, or in some sense, the state has almost ceased to exist. A pre-modern zone where the state has failed and a Hobbesian war of all against all is underway. Countries such as Somalia, and until recently, Afghanistan. Now, in my view, most of the collapsed states are states that have been uh, subjected to, uh, neo, uh, to, to uh, big power uh, invasion and destabilization. Uh, but be that as it may. Second, there are the post-imperial, post-modern states who no longer think of security primarily in terms of conquest. And thirdly, of course, there remains the traditional modern states who behave as states always have, following Machiavellian principles and raison d'etat. So he goes on to emphasize that the European countries are interdependent, have access to each other's internal affairs. They, they give up part of their sovereignty and uh, they create a complex system of contracts and uh, warfare is essentially made basically impossible through this interdependence and he calls this the postmodern state. Then, of course, he's described the modern state. <clears throat> so, the shared interest of European countries avoiding a new catastrophe has proved enough to overcome the normal strategic logic of distrust and concealment. Mutual vulnerability has become mutual transparency. The main characteristics of the postmodern world are the breakdown of the distinction between domestic and foreign affairs, mutual interference of traditional domestic affairs and mutual surveillance, the rejection of force for resolving disputes and consequent codification of self-enforced rules of behavior, the growing irrelevance of borders. This has come about both through the changing world state, but also through missiles, motor calls, motor cars and satellites. Security is based on transparency, mutual openness, interdependence, and mutual vulnerability. There's a concept of the international uh, criminal court in the postmodern world. Um, so uh, he claims, what is the origin of this change of the system as a fundamental point is that the world's grown honest. A large number of the most powerful states no longer want to fight or conquer. So this is basically, you know, global economic integration. And the problem with this is it tends to put a us or them a mentality about any country that isn't fully integrated uh, as a uh, capitalist uh, uh, participant, which is the case with Syria, Iraq, uh, Libya, um, and to a lesser extent, Afghanistan. Uh, well, also, but a typical case if uh, to have a, a, a religious uh, dictatorship like the Taliban. If this is true, it follows that we should not think of the EU, even NATO, as the root cause of the half-century peace we have enjoyed in Europe. The basic fact is European countries no longer want to fight each other. NATO and the EU have, nevertheless, played an important role in reinforcing and sustaining the position. Um, the EU is the most developed example of a postmodern system. Outside Europe, Canada is certainly a postmodern state. Japan is by inclination. So location makes it hard to develop. The USA is a more doubtful case, since it is not clear that the U.S. government or Congress accepts either the necessity or desirability of interdependence or its corollaries 
corollaries of openness, mutual surveillance, and mutual interference to the same extent as most European governments now do. Elsewhere, aspirants are ASEAN, which is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, sort of modeled along uh, NATO and NAFTA, uh, the North American Free Trade Association, America Sur, the integration of South American economies, and the Organization of African Unity suggest at least a desire for postmodern environment. And though this wish is unlikely to be realized quickly, imitation is undoubtedly easier than invention. Within the postmodern world, there are no security threats in the traditional sense. That is to say, its members are not considered invading each other. Whereas in the modern world, following Postman's dictum, war is an instrument of policy of the postmodern world, a design of policy failure. But the real price, as far as I can tell, of what he's talking about, okay, uh, is. Uh, the real price is you have to be globally integrated into the super capitalist uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> the challenge to the postmodern world is to get used to the idea of double standards. This is a shocking part of what he now describes. Among ourselves, we operate on the basis of laws and open cooperative security, but dealing with more old fashioned kinds of states outside the postmodern continent of Europe, we need to revert to the rougher methods of an earlier area force, preemptive attack, deception. Whatever is necessary to deal with those who still live in the 19th century world or every state for itself. Among ourselves, we keep the law, but when we are operating the jungle, we must also use the laws of the jungle. In the prolonged period of peace in Europe, there has been a temptation to neglect our defenses, both physical and psychological. This represents one of the great dangers of the postmodern state. The challenge posed by the pre modern world is a new one. This pre modern world is a world of failed states. Here, the state no longer fulfills Weber's criterion of having a monopoly in the legitimate use of force. Either it's lost the legitimacy or it has lost the monopoly of the use of force. Often the two go together. Examples of total collapse are relatively rare. The problem is that what he doesn't address here is that in nearly all these cases, this collapse is indeed the strong preying on the weak. Uh, outside players uh, seldom do societies just collapse internally. Uh, but the number of countries at risk grows all the time. Some areas of the former Soviet Union are candidates, including Chechnya, all the world's major drug-producing areas are part of the pre-modern world. Until recently, there was no real sovereign authority in Afghanistan, nor is there in upcountry Burma, or in some parts of South America, where drug barons threaten the state's monopoly on force. All over Africa, countries are at risk. No areas of the world is without its dangerous cases. In such areas, chaos is an arm and war a way of life. The pre-modern state may be too weak even to secure its own territory, let alone pose a threat internationally. But it can provide a base for non-state actors who may represent a danger to the postmodern world. If non-state actors, notably drug crime or terrorist syndicates, take to using pre-modern bases for tax on the more orderly parts of the world, then the organized states may eventually have to respond. They become too dangerous for established states to tolerate. It is possible to imagine a defensive imperialism. It's not going too far to view the West response to Afghanistan in this light. How should we deal with the pre-modern chaos? Become involved in its own chaos is risky. If the intervention is prolonged, it may become unsustainable in public opinion. If the intervention is unsuccessful, it may be damaging to the government that ordered it. But the risks of letting countries rot, as the West did, Afghanistan may be even greater. What form should intervention take? The most logical way to deal with chaos is the one most employed in the past is colonization. But colonization is unacceptable to postmodern states, and as it happens to some modern states too, it is precisely because of the death of imperialism that we are seeing the emergence of the pre modern world. And empire and imperialism are words that have become a form of abuse in the postmodern world. Today, there are no colonial powers willing to take on the job, though the opportunities, perhaps even the need for colonization, is as great as it ever was in the 19th century. Those left out of the global economy risk falling into a vicious circle. Weak government means disorder, and that means falling investment. In the 50s, South Korea had a lower GNP per head than Zambia. One has achieved membership in the global economy, the other not. All the conditions for imperialism are there, but the supply and demand for imperialism have dried up. And yet the weak still need the strong, and the strong still need an orderly world, a world in which the efficient and well-governed export stability and liberty, which is open for investment and growth. All this seems heavenly desirable. There you go. Open for investment and growth. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an open prescription for uh, the uh, treatment of all quasi-socialist old school states, um, uh, such as Iraq, Libya.
the uh, Syria to be um, uh, vulnerable to regime change on that basis. What included then is a new kind of imperialism, one, six, uh, one acceptable to a world of human rights and cosmopolitan values. We can already discern its outline. An imperialism which, like all imperialism, aims to bring order and organization, but which rests today on the voluntary principle. Most modern imperialism takes two forms. First, there is a voluntary imperialism of the global economy. This is usually operated by an international consortium through international financial institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank. It is characteristic of the new imperialism that is multilateral. These institutions provide help to states which can find their way back in the global economy and the virtuous circle of investment and prosperity. In return, they make demands which they hope address the political and economic failures that have contributed to the original need for assistance. Now, we have, I think, John Perkins' book, uh, The Economic Confessions of an Economic Hitman, where he describes that there was actually penetration into these groups by the intelligence agencies and other operators in the government that wanted to get these countries into debt bondage so that the uh, raw materials industries and natural resources could be sold off to international investors, which is effectively what they're asking to do to Greece. Uh, aid theology today increasingly emphasizes governance. If states wish to benefit, they must open themselves up to the interference of international organization and foreign states just as for different reasons, the postmodern world has also opened itself up. The second form of postmodern imperialism might be called the imperialism of neighbors. Instantly, your neighbor poses threats which no state can ignore. He goes into the details of the former Yugoslavia. It is not just soldiers that come from the international communities, police, judges, prison officers, central bankers, and others. Wonderful, just wonderful. Elections are organized and monitored by the OSCE, local police are financed trained by the UN, as auxiliaries to this effort in many areas indispensable to it are over 100 NGOs. This is an entire uh, a regime change apparatus, uh, potentially, as well as uh, being an apparatus to uh, provide a development along modern, uh, globally integrated super capitalism lines. One additional point needs to be made. It's dangerous if a, if a neighboring state is taken over in some way by organized or disorganized crime, which is what state collapse usually amounts to. And so and Landa now demonstrated that for those who have not already realized that today, all the world is potentially at least their neighbor. Balkans are a special case. The postmodern EU offers a vision of cooperative empire, common limitary, uh, liberty, and a common security without the ethnic domination and centralized absolutism to which past empires have been subjected. Uh, subjected. And uh, you can read the complete article on your own. Um, but what I'm arguing here is that uh, this is the kind of uh, mindset that uh, is informing these people uh, to be able to disregard uh, and continue to do the same thing over and over. That what you don't want about a crime or a criminal is you don't want them to keep repeating the same crime over and over. So as we had in Iraq, we repeat the crime in Libya. We get the same results in Libya. And then we try to repeat the crime in Syria. And they're doing it to this very day. Nearly Clinton, who I claim we have reasonable evidence to suspect, had no need to attack Gaddafi's military. Uh, we already had uh, their attention. Um, uh, and they were uh, uh, had stopped their army, etc. Uh, uh, that they just uh, pour forth with this uh, regime change of philosophy. And uh, that now she wants to impose that in Syria with the insane idea that you can have three different sets of units operating in the same country all on different sides at the same time. Nobody's played any serious war games thinks there's any such thing as a checkerboard with really more than two sides. It just doesn't make sense. Everyone needs to get on a side. You may pick one and then the other. But this is bizarre. This is beyond bizarre. This is like a, a you know, a pit fight. Um, so it's madness to uh, insert uh, three different sets of combatants. And what was happening is that it's, it, there's a very little breathing room between the jihadists and the state now. Um, and of course, both sides are probably trying to pull them. Al Nusra is trying to pull certain elements of the uh, other moderate, but these moderate, um, 
units know, everybody's asked me to report again, uh, so let me do that and conclude, um, which is the study of Syria. So uh, let's see if I can find this. So I have here on this uh, page um, the breakdown of forces uh, according to my estimate. So Syrian army, 185,000. What I've done here, free Syrian army, 27,000. It's probably not that far off the mark. This army of conquest is al-Nusra combined with, uh, with other groups. I think this Muhajin wa Ansar is probably in the army of conquest. Um, so um, they're a small, small part of the overall conflict because I estimate around a total of, um, uh, what's my total number here? 404,000 actual active uh, belligerents in the conflict. Uh, so at any rate, my name is Alexander Hagen.